A man with a dream with plans to make free. A man with a dream. Generational wealth, that's the key. Uh, I'm uh, headed uh, to uh, the uh, bank right now. Right now. Generational wealth, that's the key. That's the key. That's the key. It's BYOB, the Generational Wealth Podcast. You did. Get money. And now your host, hey, Donahue Baker. Get the truth to the young youth. Welcome to the BYOB Generational Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, A. Donahue Baker, and in this episode, we are interviewing o- Ofo Izugu, but can't we? Yeah, Ofo Izugu, I the government don't want to butcher first. your name. <laughs> don't want to butcher your name, but okay. really appreciate it. Ofo is the CEO and founder of Who's Your Landlord, which is awesome an- website. Just had to bring it to the audience and let y'all really see what this is. But this show focuses on building generational wealth. We focus on entrepreneurs and what better story than to hear Ofo's story of how he started, how he made money, and not only that, how he was able to raise money, a lot of money, uh, for his program, for his uh, entrepreneurial endeavor. And we're going to jump right into that. Ofo, you want to just jump right in and tell tell our audience where you're from? Yeah, most what, definitely. And and a little bit about a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so uh, again, as mentioned, my name's Ofo. Um, so I think my story always starts with my parents' story. Uh, my dad's from Nigeria, my mom's from Barbados. Um, I always say the act of, of being an immigrant moving to another country is entrepreneurial unto itself, simply because you know you're stepping out on faith and and hoping that. And really, it's almost like you have no choice but to succeed in some way, right? In order to, to provide for your family, not just your nuclear family here in whatever country that is, but the country you came from, you got to still support for them as well. So, um, you know, I grew up out in Maryland primarily. I uh, went to school out in Philly at Temple University. Um, it was during my senior year uh, where I was the VP of the, the student body. And uh, students were complaining a lot about housing issues simply because gentrification was becoming a real thing in North Philly. And that meant a lot of new landlords were moving in, but not really understanding how to, you know, what the laws were, how to engage with residents, that kind of stuff. So not only were students having these issues, but community members were too. So we started off as a simply review platform um, for students to use uh, at different colleges and expanded out. Um, now we're at a point where we have over 120,000 renters on the platform every month, um, over 15,000 reviews in the Northeast alone. And reviews in over two hundred forty cities nationwide. Very, very um, impressive. But thanks, man. Just thanks. so, just so we don't, you know, we don't want people to think it happened overnight. Facts. So facts. How yeah. long did it yeah. take you to go from, you know, one or two users yeah. to the hundred and twenty thousand users that your site currently has? Yeah, man. Uh, about five years. So we started this in twenty thirteen, um, and have been building it ever since. A team of ten of us now. Um, you know, we, I, I was there when it was one, then three, then, you know, five, then three again, you know, I'm like, you, you kind of play with that as you grow out. But, um, I think the key thing is it's been persistence, but also just listening to the market, listening to what your consumers and users are saying. And so now we've made software for landlord, property managers and developers to better engage with their residents, to better understand the sentiment of their residents too. So we want to, we want to create more transparency. I think that goes both ways. Um, just like there's great tenants, there's great landlords and vice versa, right? So that's been the key. So so one of the great things about your idea, number one, is in the real estate space, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's many different ideas and many different sites. What makes your site unique? I think what makes it unique is we're, I think, one of the few sites or one of the first sites to really initially focus in on the residents' experience. Um, a lot of times people quickly think, oh, the money's with the landlords, the buildings, the property managers, so I'm going to build a business that purely caters to them. I think what we've realized is is by building a platform that better serves residents, that also has an inherently good effect for good landlords as well. Um, we, have, we have one uh, development company based out of upstate New York who acquired a, a housing portfolio, wasn't doing too well, had bad reviews online. They rebranded, renamed, and just did a better job for two years, got really great reviews on Who's Your Landlord, 3X their portfolio value, and that's about $42 million worth of value that increased from being good landlords. So now every time they pitch investors, they have our screenshots on the on the screen, um, and they're saying like this is important. Um, and I think that this, the residents have the same exact cadence when it comes to you know, understanding what they should expect before signing a lease and also when they're in a situation. What I love about your story is you, you started 
very young. Mm-hmm. You know, age is, is relative. <laughs> but you started, you had a you had an idea and you were able to really flush that out. Right. One of the the key challenges that most people or most young entrepreneurs have is raising money. Right. You hit it out the box. You were able to raise seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Please let <laughs> young entrepreneurs know how yeah. you were able to do you know, awesome job of raising that money mm-hmm. and what other challenges. And, and I know you're going through another round of funding. Sure. You're raising $2 million on this next round mm-hmm. of funding. But just to even get your 750 seed capital, yeah. that's that's a major, major win for you. Tell us how you were able to do that and some of the challenges that you were up against during raising that money. 100%. So I, I think, so I, I'm, I'm very big on being just authentically real about the situation. I wish that it was a situation where I could say, in we, we set out to raise 750k we raised that we move forward in that kind of in that kind of narr- narration it's like you're strategically then able to allocate how you spend 750 to grow that's not at all how it end up happening what happens is someone gives you 200 here someone gives you 50 there 100 there and this then piles up but i think that the tough part is that because of that approach it, it rarely gets to just be used strategically. A lot of times it's like making up for lost ground on where you should be, who you can hire next, what where the product should go next. Um, but, you know, speaking to how we initially started, we got out there and pitched at competitions. Um, our first, like, real check was a $20,500 $20, check from Temple University's Be Your Own Boss Bowl. And um, we had submitted a business plan. I remember some of the judges came up to me afterward and were like, yo, I've been doing this competition for like at least a decade. It's the best business plan I've ever seen. And the reason why we got really good at it was we applied three different times. The first one was a completely different business. It was my first business. It took me and my team about four months to create that business plan. Um, and that was with us partitioning off who did which sections. The second year we came back, we had Who's Your Landlord was a concept at the time. It took us about, I think it was a, a two weeks to, to do that, to get the business plan all done. Um, and I just sat there and kind of just rolled it out. And then uh, right before spring break. And then the third year, um, we actually applied a little bit more stats and stuff, but I sat at my computer, by the time I was in New York, I sat at my computer for nine straight hours and just banged it out. And uh, the timing, as you can see, four months, two weeks, nine hours got shorter because we knew what people were looking for. We were at, out there act- actively pitching investors, not getting money, mm-hmm. but learning the game. And so um, by the time we were you know, presenting a business plan for a competition, we were you know, head and shoulders above the rest because we were in, in real live action meeting investors. So the fact that you were out there grinding, pitching, going to competitions, meeting with other investors, right. getting feedback, sometimes tweaking and readjusting your business plan shows that you had a certain stick to Absolutely. And that's so important for entrepreneurs to just grasp. And a lot of times they think, oh, I got an idea. Now I just, you know, need to just bring it to the right person. Right. So what I want to do is just jump into what the site is going to look like. Sure. And uh, just just to just to provide the user experience of what that is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so on the platform itself, what's great about it is we keep the UI UX very sleek, just in terms of your engagement with the platform itself. Um, but for a resident, they can review their home provider. So that's their landlord, property management, or apartment building in seven key categories, ranging from responsiveness to condition of property, safety. Um, and we also provide a lot of housing literacy content. Um, many, many of our videos actually have gone viral. So we've had about 3 million views now on our videos in the last year and a half. Um, and it talks about everything from, we've, we've touched on redlining, gentrification, um, public housing, um, to just more more like mundane things that happen in your home that I think people just don't speak too often. Um, so from a user perspective, there's a lot, a treasure trove of information from the content we provide, but also from the reviews. Um, and then for a home provider, so a landlord, developer, um, uh, you know, property manager, what's great is from our platform, they create a profile, they can manage the profile, respond to reviews right on the website. Um, they're given like a, a vanity link that really is a survey so they can send it out to their residents to receive verified reviews back. Um, and also in real time, we're aggregating reviews from all over the web. So whenever they're mentioned on Google reviews, Facebook, Yelp, apartments.com, we actually put it in one location so they can respond to all those reviews in one, one space and see month over month how they're charting on those different sites as well. Awesome, awesome. So how do you consider yourself? Are you a real estate entrepreneur? <laughs> you just an entrepreneur? Yeah. How do you classify yourself? Man, it's been a it's been a beautiful journey because, you know, I've always I've always kind of grasped how important real estate is, but until you're you're in the space and then you're meeting people that live and breathe this every day, 
You just don't understand how, from a wealth building perspective, how important real estate is. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I real estate tech entrepreneur, I guess, but um, I'm, I'm just an entrepreneur at the end of the day, you know, because I think that if there was another medium to build who's your landlord on or, or to solve the problem who's your landlord solving, I would have used that medium. Just tech happened to be it. Um, and so I'm, I, I hustle in the sense that whatever the path is to get to the end goal, I'm, I'm all for. So long as it's positive, it's productive, and it's building our communities. Um, and so I just want to keep building, man. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So that being said, we definitely got to jump in. I got to pick your mm -hmm. brain on a number of different topics. Sure. You talked about your business, mm -hmm. but now let's get a little bit deeper and talk about what's going on in our communities. And right. we see what's happening right now. And I'll tell you an example, Jersey City. So I had this property in Jersey City, Journal Square actually paid maybe about 130 grand for it. Gotcha. Four years later, you know, this was, you know, maybe 10 years ago though. But four years later, property is selling for 500 grand. Mm -hmm. um, the, the landscape has changed. Right. We see people coming into our community, and I see that happening right now in Newark, New Jersey. Right. right? So downtown right now, there's over 4,000 residential units that are going to come on the market mm -hmm. within the next three to four years. Right. So what's happening is you have uh, the rents. They're, they're starting to go up. Right. But mm -hmm. the landscape is starting to change. You're starting to see a new demographic yeah. come into the city. I wanted to just pick your brain on the whole perspective because I noticed that there's a certain philosophy yeah. <laughs> with the with the WIL, right? Sure. What what are you trying to accomplish in the in the, the communities? Are you trying to address certain issues that are taking mm -hmm. place in the communities or are you just mm -hmm. trying to provide the best utility you can? I think first and for, I mean first and foremost is the core tenants of the of the business itself, right? It was always predicated on transparency and then transparency leading to accountability. But information was key in, in making and creating a transparent space. And so, you know, I'm, I'm huge on the community. It's always been that way. I've been a big and big brothers, big sisters for years. I've um, gotten to speak at the White House on the My Brother's Keeper initiative. I've, um, I speak a lot at local high schools, middle schools, elementary schools. Started the Kids to College program at Temple University where we would gather folks from the community and would go to different schools, speak to students so they understood like you could be whatever you wanted to be when you grow up. So naturally, that was who I have been. It's who I am. And so there was always going to be that natural bend for whatever company I was going to build. Um, and so I, I feel really genuine about the fact that I live on brand. How I feel inside is what I get to manifest every day through our business and through my team and team members and what they produce. Um, and so I think when I think about the real estate perspective, you can't tell a full story reviews wise if you're not giving background as to you know what are what are the nuances in different people's experiences um and so that i learned that very early on when we were pitching who's your landlord you know students were like this is great this is awesome but residents in the community were like yo i could use this like can you make it for me you know and i was like you probably need it more than the students because a lot of times they can maybe lean on their parents to cover their rent and they're maybe having parties or whatever and kind of contributing to the issues they're having at times where folks in the community aren't always afforded either the information on how to best deal with situations and or, you know, the landlords treat them a certain way because they look a certain way. Um, and that's a problem at times. What yeah. borough are you in, New York City? Uh, I live in Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn. So I'm sure Brooklyn, I'm, I'm sure you know all about yeah. what's going on in Brooklyn yeah. right About in best yeah. Right. So how long have you been at best Been there six years. Grandfather has been there for over 40 years. Right. So, so yeah. you, you, you can fully relate, right? Yeah. What? How how do you think um, gentrification mm -hmm. is affecting our communities right now in, in, in areas like that? And right. when I when I say that, I'm talking about from the perspective of affordable housing, right. and and also from the perspective of people that really can't you know they, they can't afford to 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 live in these areas in which they've been living there probably their whole lives. Like right. they have histories, like you said, your grandfather. Mm -hmm. You know, what is your take on gentrification right now? Yeah, well, you know, if we're being really candid about it, there's not there's not one right answer, right? Because we, we can't sit here and, and say that gentrification is all bad because it does. There is investments that are returning to our communities, um, and in situations, I think what becomes tough is that we talk about general generational wealth for the for, as a topic for this show, and a lot of times because we're not given access to information, there's been countless situations. I remember when I first moved to Bed Stuy. I just was I just threw in a, a random address on our street 
um, on the Zillow. And it, it, the, I think the cheapest house at the time was like 800000 And that's a, that was a lot from where, I mean, my grandfather got his spot for like 10000 bucks in 1969, I believe. And so um, when I saw that, I was like, this is very interesting. But I had heard so many stories about older folks selling their homes for like 350000 400000 cash. They had never seen that much money in front of them at one point in time, right? And so you have these developers who were taking advantage of the fact that they knew these residents didn't have the information to understand a quick Zillow search, like three seconds, like just typing it in, would have told you your properties were double, triple that, you know? And so when we get taken advantage of in those kind of ways and the city doesn't do as much as it can to make sure that doesn't happen, um, a lot of times I, there was always this narrative as I was growing up where I would, I would talk to my cousins who lived in Far Rockaway. And I'd be like, yo, uh, you know, how's John doing? How's Tim doing? Whoever. But like, yeah, you know, he just moved to South Carolina. So and so just moved to Virginia. And I was like, why is everybody always moving south? And then you start realizing, well, when you get priced out, like where else are you going to go? Um, and so I think there can be positive ways to have to reverse what disinvestment has done in our communities, a lack of providing loans so that people could renovate their properties and then rent them out. Um so there's positives that can come with better amenities. Um, there are, you know, new elevators in the subways all of a sudden. Every subway has the monitor that tells you when trains are arriving. Um, but the problem is, unfortunately, every single time we get bounced before these things happen. But the cities have to understand, you know, when you're, when you're removing the cultural resonance of a neighborhood, you're fundamentally changing that and the residents that are, are moving in and thinking this is cool now like it, if it's a fad that'll fade and so the, the the actual fabric of those communities and neighborhoods are the people that have been there and so you you can't have them to, to prosper you have, can't have them continue to prosper if the whole reason people are actually moving there is no longer there one of the, the things that I hear a lot from young people, mm -hmm. millennials, is they say, well, we're probably going to be the first generation in which we don't do as well as our parents because mm -hmm. my parent owned a house. Right. And I don't think I can own a house. And I try to tell them, you know, self-defeating thoughts. Right. You right. can own a house. Now, if you live in New York City, it's difficult. Sure. Because <laughs> the, price, the price is difficult, right? Mm -hmm. But... Less than 15, 20 miles away in New Jersey, mm -hmm. you can own a house for 100000 right. for 50000 for 20000 for 10000 It just depends where and, and what you're looking for. Right. So one of the things, and in, in, um, rest in peace, Nipsey Hussle, mm -hmm. I got I to harken back to him because mm -hmm. he created a business model in which he said, you know what, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to invest in my community right. and I'm going to buy houses. So one of the things that he was working on when he was um, – before he, mm -hmm. he, he left this prematurely, mm -hmm. one of the things he was working on was going and buying affordable housing in his community. Yeah. And, you know, call it what it is, Los Angeles is, is kind of just like New York. Sure. It's expensive mm -hmm. housing. So the thing is, is that, you know, what I'm looking, what I'm looking to uh, start right now is to get young people to say, I'm going to take advantage of the FHA loan. The FHA mm -hmm. loan pro pro product it basically allows you to purchase a house for 3.5% down. And I've been pushing this and pushing this and pushing this, but there's no other way in which you can basically acquire a, a very expensive asset for as little money as that. Right. You know, right. but the way to do it is to do it in a multifamily format where you can purchase up to a four unit, maybe rent out two or three units, get this income coming in, and all in all, you'd be living rent free. Right. So I've been helping people do that, and I've helped lots of people acquire their first apartment building, you know, that same way, you know, and I think that Newark is a city right now that's going through some changes and we're starting to see the beginning of gentrification. We're starting right. to see what Jersey City was five years ago. Newark is, is, is heading in that direction. And the reason why that's important is because before the prices for a four family get to be astronomical, mm -hmm. right now in Newark today, for a hundred thousand dollars, you can purchase a four family apartment complex, uh -huh. a four family house. Uh -huh. It's Newark. Now, when I say it's Newark, it's convenient to everything. You yes. can be in Manhattan mm -hmm. in thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. You can be in South Jersey. You can be in Philly. You can wherever it is. It's like it, it's still a central location, right. but. Five years from now, I'm not sure it's going to be the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling people, look, the key in gentrification is spotting trends. Right. If you can spot a trend, you can be very, very wealthy. Right. If you're able to capitalize on that. So. Mm -hmm.
I think there's this myth, and I'm glad you actually you talked a lot about how long it's taken, how we've been building, because there's this myth that, you know, two years and then sell it for several hundred million and bounce. Like, it, it first of all, that we're not afforded a lot of the same opportunities, especially white men are afforded, right? Like, if you're starting out the gates, I mean, I remember I, I've been to uh, pitch, like, just pitches in basements, like, just a well-designed basement where investors will gather to hear business pitches. And I remember this happened recently in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, where um, one man got up and said, I have I got a $100,000 investment from my friends and family. I was like, that's a lot of bread to get from your friends and family. The next um, person got up, it was like, um, a complete 45-year-old woman who was saying she gave raised about three to four million from her friends and family. Then the third guy got up, middle-aged white guy, and was like, yeah, I put seven million of my own money into this company. It's like this was their seed capital, right? Um, and so when, when that's the dynamic and the framework, like, I genuinely think if if people that were of lesser means than people that have a lot of means really understood the difference, like the disparity, people would be up in arms. Like it, it's really crazy. Um, and so we we think, and I you know I mentioned the competition first, but like my, our real first two hundred k check came from the fact that um, one of my friends in high school that I would play pickup football with all the time. He hit me up to get entrepreneurial advice and then was kind of like, oh, by the way, like my dad um, sold his like biotech company. It's like spending time in the Bay Area now. I think he's making investments. I don't know if you want me to mention that. I'm like, you should have started the call with that. <laughs> like, and But it, yeah. like, even though we showed up in suits and we pitched and pitched, like we really got that check because I knew his kid. You know what I mean? And I went to school with his kid. So it was like, all right, I know what kind of person you are because I know your makeup because you went to school with my son. Right. And so, but that that's that's yeah. deep though. But that's why I admire entrepreneurs such as yourself that grind, that hustle, that know how to do it. And that's what I want to show people. And maybe you can just give people like three pointers when you're trying to raise money, right? Mm -hmm. Specifically, where do you go? Like, give give them some resources of, of where they can go to to to, to fund their business idea. Um, if they if they've tried those alternatives maybe they you can give them some other resources yeah um first and foremost look in your community for competitions that are going on um business plan competitions because at the very least you'll learn how to get become a better presenter a better storyteller um and and it helps because you're always pitching as a founder you're pitching to your team to keep them motivated pitching to customers pitching to potential customers pitching to investors um so that i would say that first and foremost secondly would be accelerators um, where we can't get 25, 50, 100K checks from our family, they can usually write us a check like that in, in those kind of accelerators that put you around other like really driven and passionate people. And if anything, it's just infectious, you know? And, and, and let me just say something about the accelerators yeah. too. There's accelerators in just about every single yep. major city. And I would just say, and if you're in an accelerator, you know, that the, there's another myth and it's like come demo day, you pitch in front of investors, people start throwing checks. Unless you're in Y Combinator, like that's just not reality. But it's important that as you're in that program, you're already preparing for how you're going to raise capital thereafter. The third thing I would say is, and this is what happened with us. I, by by getting out there, I spoke, used to speak at a lot of schools and stuff, would speak a lot of, on a lot of panel events. Um, and, you know, you never know who's in the audience and um, or who's on the panel with you. And I just, I was fortunate and blessed to meet. Um, I, remember, I remember talking about who's your landlord. This was my early, early days. Like a 33-year-old white Jewish guy who was like, that's a great idea. And, um, you know, he was too important for me at the time. So, like, in trying to coordinate just didn't end up working out. But, again, just being present, I ended up applying for a business competition at Fordham that we won. And it was like a two- or three-day intensive. And he was the same guy was actually one of the judges for that. So he saw me again. So my co-founders, like, my team was like, oh, you guys are really about this. And then from that point on, we created a relationship where for, I remember that was a, such a brutal winter, but every week on Thursdays, I would take a train from Brooklyn to the Bronx where he was living with his wife at the time. And we, he had a big screen and we would put up our financials and we'd go through them and he would rake us over the coals about how bad they were. And we would have to get better at talking to numbers. We'd pitch, we'd pitch. We, and this would be grueling for like four or five hours. Then we'd go home and then we'd come back the next week. And, um, but it was that three or four months where we did that consistently where at that point we were in a different space, like mentally, because we understood how, how the game was played. And there was things he would bring up that I'd be like, like we, the investors that invest in like people of color, we tend to know them. It's like a handful maybe. Yeah, I could imagine. Um, 
he would bring up investment groups in like Idaho. I'd be like, <laughs> what? And he would just, he would have flights to like Idaho or some random part right. of Texas. Right. And there's always this angel investor community that we just don't know about. Right. So um, I respected him. I respect him a lot because he would uh, talk a lot about his privilege and then give us give us access to the information. And right. that helped. Tell us what, you know, is next on the horizon yeah. for not only you, but also W-Y-L. Yeah, man. Uh, WIO first is uh, get this money rolling, man. Like we uh, created this amazing software for home providers, um, you know, and thanks for, for testing it out as well, man. Um, but, you know, the real goal there is to make sure it's providing value. Um, and we know if it is, then we'll see our monthly recurring revenue um, continue to rise. We'll, that'll turn into more investments. That'll turn into more value for our end consumers on both sides. Um, so that's that's what's next. It's just this beta that we're working through over the next few months. Um, for me personally, it's keep building it. Keep building Who's Your Landlord. Keep investing my time, my resources, my energy into it um, because I've, I've already been blessed to see a lot of the outcome. And, um, you know, while we're not where we're going to be yet, um, I know that I've learned a lot about real estate. I've learned a lot about the, like the investment game, social impact investing and just general business investment. Um, I've gotten a chance to to speak to a lot of amazing people and really network across. That's now turned into a really strong network up. And um, that'll turn into a lot of stuff. But I, I know I want to get into real estate development. I know I want to continue to get more to investment. Um, and I love entertainment as well. I've been an actor and model since 2011. Done some pretty dope shows with like Today Show, Nike, ESPN. So I got a, a lot of skills that I've been blessed with. And um I think as you build out who's your landlord, it's only going to open up more opportunities in other places too. Awesome, 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 awesome. Well, definitely want to tell you thank you so much for being on the BYOB Thanks, podcast. Man. Looking forward to having you back on. I want to definitely um, just let everyone know because we're going to be talking about your website and and – because I'm going to use it, right? Dope, so dope. we talked before about doing the beta, but right. I really want to show the utility. I mean, I love the reviews, and mm -hmm. I definitely want to you know, put my properties on there mm -hmm. and let let people, my tenants, mm -hmm. uh, kind of rate them. <laughs> um, Your goal, you, you have to understand, people, when they're angry, tend to run to a site, right? Um, which then means that, well, how are you getting good reviews if people tend to feel good about something? They just don't say anything. It's like, this is great. This is I'm, I'm neutral <laughs> as a result. Um, and so when we first started, we had like sliding scales, like it was always the same seven categories. But what we would see is that if a person loved their landlord, they gave them five out of five in every category. They couldn't stay in them. They gave them one out of fives. But that's not really helpful. So we interviewed 100 residents, 50 landlords, created a questionnaire that was based off of the premise of those surveys that we were doing with them and um, created, I think, a really robust system as to how people post reviews now. Um, the thing about it still, though, is that what will happen is because people naturally answer questions more honestly when you put a real question in front of them. Um, but they'll go through it and I see there's, there's no score revealed to the end. You do it purposefully so we get the most fair and unbiased review possible. But you'll see every now and then is someone will, a landlord will earn a pretty good score. But at the end it was like, my experience was horrible. <laughs> it's like, but you can't, you know, in terms of the questionnaire, you couldn't really pinpoint why. So, um, I think getting better at sentiment analysis, what, what exactly is the person feeling? But aligning it with the truth of what they act, like the objective truth of what they're experiencing, right? So we've created and we're working with a company that's creating this software um, where it's like conversational. So you feel like you're talking to me maybe, right, as you're leaving a review. But that way we get a better sense of how you genuinely feel. Thank you so much for being Absolutely. on the BYOB Generational Wealth Podcast. People, end of the day, we got to support our own. Who's your landlord is a excellent excellent site and it's just i think there's just the tip of the iceberg we're going to be hearing about this site a lot in the future jump on fill around sign up register do what you can we all need some place to live rate your landlord give some reviews this is this is a utility it's something we all can use this man started it oh four he's the founder he, it's his idea. He ran with it. I showed you exactly step by step the struggles that he had to do to raise his money to the point right now where he's even looking to raise more money so he can reach more people and grow his site. Absolutely, man. Uh, check us out, wylandlord.com. Um, follow us on Instagram, Twitter at wylandlord, Facebook, who's your landlord. Um, and looking forward to building together. Yeah, post those reviews and uh, get registered on the platform. That's what's up. Peace.